接下来我们要进行的是各位想必都相当期待的大师讲座。那再次提醒大家，在我们讲座开始之前，请在座的各位可以先将您的手机连上 4G 网路，没有 4G 网路的人也可以连上本馆的 NTSEC Free WiFi。我们今天非常荣幸可以邀请到行政院的唐凤政务委员来和大家分享台湾社会创新发展趋势，将以创新的方式利用线上会议软体 Slido 来进行 Q&A， 而且跟现场的观众互动。Next up is the much anticipated keynote. Before the keynote begins, please connect your cell phone to 4G or NTSEC free Wi-Fi. We're very honored to have Minister Without Portfolio, Ms. Audrey Tang, to talk to us about the development and trends of Taiwan's social innovation. Minister Tang will be using Slido to interact with the audience. 行政院唐凤政务委员是中华民国第一位数位政委，负责督导数位经济与开放政府发展，并强化政府部门与公民科技。公民社群的对话与合作。Minister Tang is the first digital minister in our nation's history, and she's in charge of facilitating dialogues and collaborations between government agencies and the public via technology. 那我们现在屏幕上播放出来的这个 QR 码，就是让大家可以扫描，然后来进行 Slido 互动的 QR 码。好，请大家可以拿出手机扫描。So now on the projection screens are the QR codes with which you can access、uh, Slido. So please take out your mobile device and scan the QR codes. 好，大家可以稍微花一点时间来扫描一下我们投影片上面的 QR 码。Please take a second to scan the QR codes、uh, with your mobile device. Let's put our hands together for Miss Audrey Tang. Yeah, what's up? Oh, that's like the the first tough voted、uh, question quote question.、Um, so really happy to be here and share with you some thoughts around social innovation. And we have around、um, like 55 minutes, and my talk will be crowdsourced, meaning that uh, uh, if you can scan the QR code,、uh, you can enter anonymously、uh, your questions and vote on each other's questions. So the one with the most number of likes will float to the top.、Uh, and if you、uh, want other people to vote on your questions,、uh, you can start lobbying、uh, your neighbors now.、Uh, and uh, what I will do uh, <laughs> is um, just read out、uh, each of the questions、uh, on the top. Uh, in sequence, and then uh, start uh, moving to the parts of the slides that people are interested in. So just to give people、uh, some time to scan the QR code, if you cannot scan the QR code for, for some reason, you can also go to slido.com. That's s l i d o dot com, and enter to the state that's two zero four without the pound sign.、Uh, either way, you will get into the same、uh, chat room.、Um, and so apparently, twenty four people would like twenty six now、uh, would like me to uh, start uh, greeting uh, you in a this. A very、uh, strange language, an alien language. Piri ka piri la la popoli na bebe luto. Maybe this is a, a new kind of language that I'm really happy to learn. And, and then after、uh, answering each question, I would just archive it like this. I already said what's up, so I will archive this too.、Um, and uh, nine people、um, would like to uh, greet. Um, Their principal, probably the principal of the Jianguo Senior High. There's a sizable crowd from Jianguo、uh, Senior High there, <laughs> and so、um, greeting to the principal. All right. So、uh, the first serious question it seems.、Um, 15 people, 17 would like me to talk a little bit about、uh, my experience in doing my own science fair project and how does it affect my、uh, career so far. So I'm uh, 38 years old now.、Uh, so my first science fair project、uh, was back in the primary school. But the one that、uh, won my、uh, kind of national first place、uh, is when I was 15 years old, and that was 1996. 
At the time, uh, my project was doing um, like this very cool name called Computational Philosopher. But what it does mean is just machine learning and inferencing. And it's just a simple AI project that lets you pr process first order, second order logic in a kind of language uh, agnostic manner. And so the idea is that you can enter queries in any language to query database of any language, simple things. But in any case, uh, that science uh, really changed my uh, life, really, because uh, during that time, it seems that there really is no textbook talking about computational um, linguistics uh, that fits the junior high school curriculum. So I have to start discovering uh, new preprints on this new, uh, newly invented technology called the wild web. The wild web was just popularized back at, at that time. And so I have to read a lot of preprints uh, on a certain website that I'm sure that you're also quite familiar with. It's called archive, archiv.org, uh, which is from Cornell University and hosts all the journal articles uh, before they get printed. They post the preprints for peer review uh, to across the world. So what was used to be a kind of closed academic community uh, review platform <coughs> become accessible by random 14 years old students uh, in Taiwan. And so because in Taiwan, we have internet as ex uh, access as uh, human rights. We had that policy then. We have uh, broadband as human rights now. Uh, and so that means that everybody can very affordably download uh, those preprint papers uh, from the open access website. They just start writing to the professors. And it seems that <coughs> they don't care that I, my English is not so good, that uh, I'm uh, just 14 years old because nobody can tell that from my email address. And they just uh, treat me as a fellow researcher. And so we started just working together. And so uh, I won the science fair, uh, and the Ministry of Education, of course, said that you're now uh, you know, guaranteed to get into whichever senior high school of your choice. Uh, and then I uh, talked to my principal, and the principal said, yeah, of course, just get you into the top uh, senior high school, and then the top university, and then you can start working as a kind of postdoc uh, with your favorite professor uh, in that um, you know, university. And I talked to the principal saying, you know, I just you know, collaborated with that professor. Uh, and, and so it seems that I can skip 10 years of education just by accessing this archive.org website. And so my principal, actually a very creative lady, uh, read the email printout of my you know, exchange with the professor and, and the uh, teams from archive.org. And she said, after considering for a couple of minutes, saying, OK, from tomorrow on, First, I will not convince you to get into any senior high schools because it seems you're doing fine by your own. And second, that you don't have to go to our junior high school anymore. So <laughs> I quit junior high when I was 15 years old with the full blessing of my teachers and, and the principal. And that is because they see that the future of human knowledge is being co-created on the wild web and instead of uh, in classrooms. And so that led to the curriculum change uh, in Taiwan that now enables this kind of flexible um, educational facilities so that everybody, uh, even in senior high schools, can start uh, choosing their own classes, and that took effect uh, last year. And so I think this 10 years of experimental uh, education is really informed by that single kind of choice of our principal saying that you don't have to go to school anymore and I will cover for you because that paves the way of the bureaucratic creativity and things like that. So I founded quite a few uh, companies uh, after that, uh, web startups, and I get into uh, this political system called the uh, Internet Society. And this is the kind of political system that decides, for example, .tw, uh, the domain name uh, where it goes, or .amazon, whether it goes into a rainforest or whether it goes into a multinational company. Uh, and so that kind of political system uh, everybody can join with just an email address and that kind of political system is based on the idea of radical transparency uh, based on the idea of rough consensus and the basic idea of science which is uh, permissionless innovation whatever you want to innovate you can just innovate and get other people to start adopting by publishing uh, instead of perishing and so that is uh, the basis of a new political system and that is my native political system so it's not uh, until like when i was 20 years old do i get my first vote and it seems to me that a democratic system is so kind of last century, actually two centuries before, uh, compared to the in, uh, international political system that we're now, by now, very um, familiar with how the Wikipedia is governed, how the blockchains are governed, and things like that. So I decided to apply what I learned when I was uh, 15 years old into the political system uh, based on radical transparency and rough consensus. And so that literally changed my life. And so I'm happy that I got a lot of uh, private sector experience also, working with Siri technology in Apple for six years. Uh, again, working on chatbot uh, language agnostic, like exactly my science fair project. Uh, but, but also now uh, working after retiring from 
the private sector uh, in the digital uh, minister's role. So that's uh, the effect of Science Fair on my uh, career. All right, so, um, wow, 65 questions. You guys are really uh, curious a lot. Okay, <laughs> um, so HD and 40 other people would like to know, how does the government deal with, quote, fake news? If that, quote, fake news has already gone viral, is there any way to address it? Now, I, I'm really happy that you put uh, the fake news in air quotes, because that is something that, a, a term that I never use. Um, because in Taiwan, news and journalism translates to the same word, sing wen. So there is no way to say fake news without offending journalists, like saying that what they're doing is, is wrong, right? Uh, and because both of my parents are journalists, so out of this local culture, we call it filial piety or xiao, xiao dao. Based on this idea, I, I really just cannot say the word, the F word. Uh, instead, we say disinformation. And disinformation uh, is a very uh, interesting issue to tackle, mostly because um, it is just perennial. It's everywhere. And there is really no way to um, just control uh, disinformation unless you control information, right? If you uh, disable everybody's ability to post online, of course, there's nowhere for this information to enter, but then there is no information to enter either. And in Taiwan, uh, where we have a very open society, we must see the freedom of expression as of the foremost importance. And indeed, uh, according to the Human Rights uh, Watch, the Civic Cosmonista for two years running now, Taiwan is the most open society in the entirety of Asia. Um, and actually, the only place where a journalist's word was worth the same as a minister's word. In every other jurisdiction in Asia, a minister's word somehow, in some cases, can supersede a journalist's word. But here, because we still remember the battle days of the martial law of authoritarianism, uh, we don't go back there. And this is why we must develop vaccines to disinformation without hurting uh, freedom of speech. So what kind of disinformation is uh, you know, uh, not subject to freedom of speech. Now, this is a widely debated topic. And in Taiwan, we have a legal definition. This is code into our existing law. We're not making new laws for disinformation. We're repurposing existing laws that already, for example, says that you cannot uh, you know, uh, spread intentional harmful untruth that harms public health, for example, during a new coronavirus outbreak that is already a criminal um, activity before the internet. So we're saying if you spread the same thing, except on um, social media, you're subject to exactly the same penalty as uh, what were already criminal behavior before. Now, an uh, important uh, distinction here is that the intentional untruths must be harmful to the public, like to the democratic process or to uh, our public health. It's not harming any person's individual image, like the image of a minister, because that's just good journalism. And so basically, intentional harmful untruths needs to be defined and need to be guarded. And uh, our idea of developing vaccines is through mimetic engineering. Now, I know there's a few genetic engineers uh, in this crowd, but I bet that everybody here is a mimetic engineer. If you spread anything on Instagram, if you spread any uh, joke, any internet meme, uh, you're participating in the mimetic evolution of internet memes. You are a contributor to the mimetic survival uh, of the various strains of uh, internet memes. And so the idea, very simply put, is that whenever there is a disinformation circulating around on the social media, even on end-to-end -end encrypted systems like LINE or WhatsApp, we must develop a vaccine in record time. And every ministry now has a team of professional comedians, except we call them mimetic engineers. Mimetic in engineers that can make jokes within two hours whenever if there's a new disinformation that's spreading around and inoculate people with those jokes. Because psychologically speaking, mimetics works on two levels. First is on the personal feeling level. If you see a rumor, a disinformation, that sparks a sense of anger in you, like there is a, such an injustice being done, even though that's wrong, you will be motivated to share it because anger is a helpless um, emotion, is a negative helpless emotion. And just pressing share without fact checking or anything like that vents that negative emotion into a positive one, which is called outrage and attacking someone. And that outrage is very destructive and it polarizes the community, but at least you feel better. 
And once you feel better, maybe you will fact check and discover that's actually wrong. But you already spread to like two people and the R zero value would be two. And then it will become a pandemic of uh, disinformation. And so the idea here, simply put, is that within two hours, now on average one hour, whenever there is a popular rumor circulating around, detected by the ministries. For example, there was one a few months ago that says, perming your hair will be subject to a one million anti-dollar fine next week. And of course that's not true. But within one hour, our premier, our prime minister, rolls out this meme, this is internet meme, that says this popular rumor is not true. And not only is it not true, there's this explanation where a young version of the premier says, even I may be bald now, I will not punish people with hair. And then a fine print that says, we're only doing a labeling requirement for hair products starting 2021. And the prime minister, as he looks now, says, however, if you keep perming your hair many times within a week, it will not damage your pocket, but it will damage your hair. When serious, you can look like me now. Right, so, <laughs> right, so you, you laugh. And once you laugh, you're inoculated. Any time you see then the disinformation, you will not be motivated by outrage because the same um, idea of uh, anger turning into outrage is blocked, this pathway is blocked by this anger turning into humor. And this is good humor because as you can see, our premier is not attacking anyone. And so instead of reinforcing people's stereotypes, what we are doing is to build a sense of public health in people's mind so that people can get into the good mental hygienic habit of fact-checking a little bit and see these memes that clarifies in, in real time. And we, of course, also rely on internet community. 20 years ago, uh, when I was doing my science fair and my uh, startups, there was this very serious issue called spam. I don't know how many people still get spam now, but back then, almost half of our inbox is spam, junk mail that says, you know, I'm a royalty, I have $2 billion, if you can just pay me $10,000 $10, as transaction fee, I will put my uh, royal whatever into your escrow, whatever, and things like that. And back the, at the time, Bill Gates was quoted as saying, you must start charging postal stamp for each email. Otherwise, email will be broken because sending unsolicited email costs nothing, and there is something in return for the con artists. And so at that time, the internet community banded together without any law, any legal action, and we set up a new norm that says anyone who receives a spam email now has a kind of moral duty to um, flag it as spam and donate the sample of spam into an international research center called the Spam House, which will then look at the sending patterns and behaviors so that when the same sender sends the next email, it lands to your junk mailbox instead of to your inbox, and thereby you will spend less attention on it, and therefore making it less economic for people to send spam email. And so we're doing exactly the same thing here for disinformation. We have this large internet community, the Colfax community, that's just look at all the line uh, messages, and because they're private, end to end encrypted, the state knows nothing about it. So how do I know the thing about perming hair is trending? It is because people voluntarily long press the signal from line, and then donate it to the research center, to the line dashboard. And then from there, line the system, distribute it to all the fact-checking partners. And the professional journalists from the international Taiwan uh, International Fact-Checking Network, of which the Taiwan Fact-Check Center uh, is one of the main members, uh, will then do a full attribution on it and publish so that everybody can, well, can learn media literacy, media competence, based on their fact-checking reports. So instead of taking anything down, we're just putting a notice, it's called notice and public notice, on the news feeds that says, oh, this has been fact-checked as wrong. Maybe you would like to think again before you share. And then Facebook also agreed to dial down its virality so that you will have to scroll like two hours to see that picture. Uh, but that's not actually taken down. If you go specifically to that friend's wall that's still there, just with a very visible notice, this is now fact-checked as false, and if you can click it, you will learn more. And so this kind of social sector empowerment that empowers everyone to be a collaborative fact-checker actually enables us to get, to get into the mindset of not just media literacy, which is for viewers and readers, but rather media competence, where everybody is now a media of our own, and we are all mimetic engineers that participate in this new idea of building a more um, 
convergent uh, social forum rather than a more diverging social forum. Because of time, uh, I can go on. This is a seminar top topic, but I will just uh, move on and answer other questions. So, um, 39 people would like to know, how can technology be applied in a classroom setting, and how will it affect our education? So I just raised two points. First is that Slido is really useful. It's free of charge. Uh, there's quite a few um, uh, similar um, ideas, uh, like uh, the Mentimeter or things like that. Uh, and it all is based on the same uh, social configuration, is that everybody brings their own device to classroom now. Everybody has their mobile device. And actually, students fact check your teachers all the time, right? The teacher may start lecture something, and you look up on Wikipedia. Hey, teacher, the Wikipedia is, is saying that what you say is not true. What do you say about that, right? So everybody is using their phone anyway. And the main problem for a teacher or lecture is that we just cannot compete with um, the Silicon Valley companies that make those social media uh, that captures people's attention. And so people become addicted. Uh, to the, the you know likelihood of people pressing likes um, of every you know ten minutes or so, we actually see students um, and even adults having kind of withdrawal uh, syndrome if you just take away their ability to press like uh, for half an hour from them. And so the teacher is essentially uh, battling with the phone uh, on capturing student attention. Now again, you can have two solutions. Either you can ban the use of mobile phones in your class and therefore create a kind of antagonistic relationship with your students. Or you can make your students' phone part of the classroom. And that's exactly what Slido did. When I ask you to scan the QR code, your um, addiction, not necessarily saying you have an addiction, but those of you who have an addiction to pressing like uh, once every two minutes now have something to press like because everything has a like button next to it. And if you want to say something, you can freely say something. So you can engage in social media while participating in the classroom, except instead of distracting from the classroom, it's attracting people to the same topic that we're uh, talking about. And you're now probably already thinking about the uh, ideas. Oh, and it also enables the people to move uh, motions because there's literally a breaking news that people watching live stream is asking me to speak closer to the microphone so that the live streamers uh, can hear much more closer. Again, this is direct feedback because already in the same classroom, it would take courage for a student to raise their hand and say, teacher, I'm hard of hearing. But if this classroom is being live streamed, there really literally is no way without introducing something like Slido for the people watching live stream to say, hey, please speak louder. But with a feedback system like this, you can react in real time without disrupting the flow of the person holding the microphone. So I hope that 46 people across the live stream feels happier now uh, and that I will speak uh, much closer to the microphone uh, at this day setting. And which brings me to, to my next point. So, as you know, uh, we're rolling out uh, the new curriculum that I mentioned briefly uh, last year. And part of the curriculum is a lot of autonomous learning classes, a lot of the school-defined classes within those different schools. And people were saying, you know, it's great that you're introducing university-like choice, freedom of choice, into the senior highs and into the junior highs even, but where do the teachers come from? If I want to learn, for example, about the indigenous nation languages, if I want to learn about the culture of uh, Sakilaya, if I want to learn about the Gaga of the Atayan, uh, are there this many teachers to go around the, the uh, Taiwan to teach about their culture? Of course, there's a shortage of such teachers. And so what we're doing is that we're showing in my um, office, which I will show you right, like right now. This is my office, by the way. Um, this is a Taiwan Social Innovation Lab. And so I'm there every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to the uh, evening. Everybody can literally walk in and have a chat with me for 40 minutes. And all I ask is that we publish. Like the whole transcript is published online. And we tore down the wall. So this is like a park. You can literally walk in from the street. And so in here, I think it's this room, uh, there is um, the idea of people teaching classes, but across the internet. It looks like this. So as you can see, here is a uh, indigenous 
teacher wearing a indigenous um, clothes, uh, immersing every classrooms around Taiwan uh, in the same natural setting of their nation. And people all across Taiwan can just participate like this and using what we call a co-teaching methodology. And the co-teaching methodology, simply put, is that a local teacher understanding the motivation of students, working with an expert teacher, in this case an indigenous culture expert, to introduce their culture to a lot of different places around Taiwan. And with 5G technology, at the moment, we can only broadcast from this kind of dedicated uh, room. But with 5G technology and very low latency, like sub-16 millisecond latency, we can actually make it as if anywhere, like in the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, the Yushan Mountain, or Savia, based on uh, indigenous language, uh, we can still live stream. There's still 10 megabits per second. And with 5G technology, there's very low delay so that everybody can feel as if we're speaking face to face. And so this kind of immersive learning transcends the boundary of space, but this is based on the idea of broadband as human rights, that everywhere in Taiwan, if you don't have 10 megabits per second, unlimited data connection at only 15 euros per month, that's my fault. And so because of that, we build our education system based on the idea that this co-teaching can tr transcend uh, both um, boundaries of classrooms, but also boundaries across sectors. And so I'm personally also teaching uh, in the Columbia University Global Classroom, where we also use Zoom to connect more than 40 universities worldwide using exactly the same co-teaching method. And so that's the two, like what we call cheap and cheerful, because you don't have to invest uh, in any new hardware. <laughs> you probably already have a projector in your classroom, and you can easily apply Slido and co-teaching without procuring any new equipment. I hope that answered this question. And I hope the live streamers um, watching the live streaming is happier. So um, the 61 people now uh, want to know, what do I think of information education in Taiwan? The curriculum of uh, last year, starting last year, uh, have a lot of change around uh, information because we now consider information, communication, technology, media, competence as a core competence instead of one or two classes. It has to be immersed in every classes. Um, and the questioner says that this is a very advanced looking, forward looking concept. And, but where are you leading us? And also uh, the teachers who are not so uh, familiar with being co-learners with their fellow teachers or with the students, um, they're kind of finding this uncomfortable. So uh, how do teachers improve ourselves so that we can learn with the students instead of just lecturing at the students? How can <coughs> teachers teach with students rather than just for students? Now, this is actually um, you know, three questions, but anyway, I will uh, answer briefly. So uh, first of all, uh, the new curriculum is not rolled out within a single year. In fact, for a primary education system, it would take six years for it to roll out completely, starting from the primary uh, school, the first grade, and all the way to the sixth grade. And so every teacher in the second, third, fourth grade, and so on, have the uh, opportunity to watch how the new curriculum is being taught at the first grade. And the same applies for the eighth and ninth grades, uh, looking at how the seventh grade is being taught, so on and so forth. And so there's plenty of room to, for teachers to start banding together and forming this co-learning group themselves and taking use of nearby universities because another flagship uh, uh, idea of the Ministry of Education is university social responsibility. And a lot of universities is now very much taking care of their local senior high school, junior high school, and even primary schools so that that they can become co-creators with even graduate students. This is now the norm in Taiwan. And so uh, this, I think, answers the idea of how teachers adapt. You don't ad adapt overnight, you adapt over the course of three years or six years. And uh, with a lot of examples uh, just teaching around you, the teachers teaching more junior students. And the next uh, direction. I think a lot of uh, ideas now is based on the fact that we simply cannot predict how many different academic disciplines will there be 12 years in the future. Uh, the entire scientific landscape, this, this entire scientific enterprise, is constantly reconfiguring itself. And so what we are now focusing on 
It's not just problem-based learning, but rather co-creative learning. So one example, you, you saw my author. And this is uh, what every day, every week, people can visit my office with this very much like Science Fair project, Innovations. And these alien-looking um, devices are self-driving vehicles. And their self-driving means that you hop on one, you tell where to go, it drives you there. The only catch is that they're really, really slow. They're slower than a person running fast. They're slower than a jogger. On the other hand, this means they're very safe. If it runs into a wall, nobody gets hurt. So this is the idea of a sandbox. So within the sandbox, anybody can apply whatever they have learned based on this platform, which is called a persuasive electric vehicle, by the way, PEV. And because it's open hardware, you can plug and play any part of the component. And because it's open source, you can change how it thinks. Because it's open data, if you're uh, measuring in anthropology, human geography, uh, things like that, you can use this evidence to shape the norm of how self-driving vehicles should interact with the local people, which differs from country to country. And so with two years of co-creation, a lot of students, some from Taipei Tech, some even more junior, co-created new models based on the original design of the PEV, based on the interaction with the local market, because we're nearby a market called the Jianguo Flower Market that runs on the weekends. So based on feedback from the market, like literally from the market, um, they would like to say, oh, we don't really want to be driven places because they're kind of slow, but they look like shop shopping baskets. So we want to shop some flowers and put it into the shopping basket. I want the car to follow me. And once it's full, uh, we want to use this advanced technology called platooning or forming a fleet so that the full cart can move back. It can summon a new empty one so I can keep doing my hands-free shopping. Uh, and to do this, not only the program need to be changed, it, the entire uh, what we call sensor fusion need to be changed because it need to detect proximity with the jungle flower market crowd. It need to understand the human face, emotion, nonverbal gestures and things like that. And this is what we call social innovation because it's not only fitting a social purpose, it is actually participating with the entirety of society. So this idea of social innovation, I think, is crucial for the future of education because then it will be informed by the local population and what you learn during your 12 years of basic education will be directly applicable to your entire community instead of being kind of in the ivory tower, this social impact is continuously created as part of your learning process. So I hope that addressed at least part of that question. So 49 people now, 51 uh, people, 52, um, <laughs> asked me whether I can perform a rap uh, for the guest today. Wow, where does that come from? Okay, um, I will read you some poetry, but that is not rapping. Uh, and I will also say that this poem is my job description, because uh, I'm sure that you've heard of sustainable development goals like these these things, like important things, decade of action. Uh, and the, the problem with the sustainable development goals is that nobody can remember all the 169 targets. Or maybe some of you can remember, you're a very smart and clever bunch, I, but I cannot remember all the 169 uh, targets. So when I became digital minister around four years ago, the HR people uh, in the administrative branch asked me, so minister, Digital minister is a new role. Would you like to write a job definition so that we can communicate with the society what does it mean to be a digital minister? I'm saying, okay, sure. My focus will be based on target 1718, which is enhancing reliable data. 1717, which is building effective cross-sectoral international partnerships. And 176, which is open innovation. And I'm sure everybody can memorize those. And then the HR people said, nobody memorized those ministers. <laughs> At that time, that was 2016. Uh, the SDGs was just passed. So nobody memorized those numbers. So you have to translate it into something, and maybe into a rap. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not a um, you know, good rapper, but I can translate into poetry. So this is literally my job description. It's pinned on my Twitter. So it reads like this. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, 
let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity may be near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So that's kind of no rap, no rap performance. Um, 50 people uh, would like to know. Um, so regulations in Taiwan and I'm sure elsewhere uh, always try to reduce risk and prioritize risk reduction over innovation. And so a lot of startups, they have these ideas, but because the regulation did not anticipate those ideas, some of the startups never get the chance to show their ideas to the society how to solve this problem. And so this is a great question, by the way. So our way is through, again, a very simple idea of a sandbox. So um, self-driving vehicles, three years ago, is not legal in Taiwan. There's no way that you can drive these things outside of our sandbox, uh, our social innovation lab, and only because they're tricycles. Once you install the force wheel, <laughs> That becomes illegal. <laughs> that was three three years ago. But on the other hand, we want people to learn about to co-domesticate with these new creatures. So the idea is literally interaction between the social norms and the market in a safe space. And this is what Sandbox is all about. And so, given the two years of running in this closed uh, place, we now introduce the idea to the National Sandbox Act. In Taiwan, which is a continental law system, we convinced our parliament to say anyone with a self-driving vehicle with a top speed of, say, 30 kilometers per hour, they can apply with the agreement with local municipality to apply for those self-driving tests after a limited closed space test, like in our social innovation lab or in the Shallow and Science City, uh, and it runs for a year. Whenever it causes any serious accident, the experiment terminates. But if it continues on without any serious uh, incidents, then we collect the data and then we publish with the academic community who will, after a year, look into the data gathered thus far and answer this question whether the local community think this is good for society or not. And if this cross in interdisciplinary team says it's a good idea, then we commit ourselves to change our regulation, to change our laws, based on your laws, based on the startup's idea of the regulation. This is not just for self-driving. We do the same for financial technology innovations, for platform economy innovations, for 5G, like millimeter wave uh, testing grounds. We have a lot of sandboxes, like a general purpose sandbox, a sandbox or a GTW, where every regulation can be challenged with uh, kind of uh, have to read a fine print. You cannot experiment on money laundering and funding terrorism because we know what will happen. So, but other than funding terrorism and money laundering, everything is fair game. You can challenge any regulation from any ministry. And so this one year or two actually gives room for the society to come to terms with technology and for the innovators and scientists to bring your ideas to fit the society. This is called appropriate technology. And for the society to appropriate your technology, to adapt it for the local need. And that is the idea of the sandbox. And this is the basis of our open innovation system. And all the three month um, sandbox systems have a chance to present to the president. So you can think of it as a presidential science fair. Um, the president every year runs the three month presidential hackathon where everybody can say, hey, I see this sustainable development goal target, like 6.4, which is saving water. And they can say, hey, I have this new idea. Instead, this person listening to the pipes that may leak um, every once in a while, so that it takes on average two months for the Jilong region, a small region, uh, for a leak to happen before it gets detected by those touring people who are here. Actually, you can just analyze the SCADA data that has the flow and pressure of the water and compare it against daily activities, signals, weather, whatever, and train this long, short-term memory, whatever, uh, you know, neural network. And then a apprentice can become a chatbot to those master repair people. And the master repair people can train their apprentice, this time a machine apprentice, to predict 
how likely is a leak to occur near them. And so they reduce the two months into two days in three months' time, which is like typical science fair time. But they, their pilot only work on this small region. But because they present the idea to the president, the president gives out five awards every year. And so every team that received the trophy, which looked like this, has a micro projector beneath this trophy. And once you turn on the micro projector, it will show the image of Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president, handing the trophy to you and promising you that your idea will be realized on a national scale within the next year. So this is a very meta trophy, right? It's a self-describing trophy. <coughs> there is no award money. But basically the award is that we do whatever it takes, regulation, personnel, budget, to realize this presidential hackathon project into everyday life, no matter what it takes. And we deliver 10 out of 10 of the 10 previous winning cases. And so that is how we elevate social innovation to the national policy status. And also a lot of those uh, ideas are actually proposed by career public servants. Actually, career public service, like my principal back when I was junior high school, is very creative. It's just there's like five levels between her and the Minister of Ed Education. And so every, every level can actually um, you know, take uh, a risk averse attitude and say, maybe let's not tell the president that, right? So what they do during the presidential hackathon is actually partnering with the civil society. And they say, oh, we're just joining a data collaborative. This idea is actually proposed by the civil society. The civil society loves the idea of measuring air quality using this, this very cheap, less than 100 euros, PM 2.5 sensors. And there's already more than 4,000 or so uh, stations in Taiwan. So we, the Korea Public Service, is just you know taking a few week weekends off on workshops to work with those social sector people. And if they don't win the trophy, there's no risk for the career public service, right? They're just, you know, attending a few weekend hackathons. But if they win the trophy, as they did uh, for the uh, various uh, new ideas, then they can just come out and say, actually, I wrote a proposal in the first place, right? So this is basically reducing the risk of career service, but also increasing the visibility of all the innovations. And so every uh, idea in the top 20 last year corresponding each to a sustainable target, is voted in by a newly invented voting method that maximizes social preference output called quadratic voting. And with the QV, we have a very balanced, not subject to the, the voting paradoxes uh, result that gets us the social collective preference that let us know what is top 20 uh, subject of data collaboratives for Taiwanese people to focus on. And this year, we, we're extending this invitation to everybody. So feel free to attend the presidential hackathon, no matter whether you're a citizen here or not. So um, let's see what's the... So 40 people would like to know, um, what about facial masks? I, I'm sure this is very topical, right? You're aware of facial masks. What about facial masks? Um, is there any contribution from me uh, that use my expertise? to ensure uh, a fair distribution of facial masks. Um, yes? <laughs> so basically, um, in Taiwan, we have a single payer, universal coverage, starting from the day you're born, um, healthcare system, the NHI. And the healthcare system uh, issues a IC card, and this is separate from your name card, this dedicated uh, for the use of health protection. And so, actually, uh, we are now, just right now, uh, coding and testing a system. We're starting from Thursday. Everybody can use their NHI card to any of the distributors of pharmacy uh, and just uh, swipe uh, the card, uh, insert the card, and then collect the kind of weekly uh, portion registration uh, mask distribution. And this is actually a very interesting application of the ICT technology because in every uh, other jurisdiction, we're facing the same problems. But without the NHI card that applies to even very young people to distribute small face masks applying to junior people below uh, 12 years old, it's actually very hard to distribute and authenticate in the same path. You have to authenticate in one path and collect on the other path, and that creates a lot of room for people to hoard the supplies. 
but using ICT, we, we can actually show exactly when do the masks arrive to each pharmacy, and in real time, like every five seconds, how the depletion rates go to all the fan pharmacy around Taiwan. So just like this map that I just showed you around air quality, you can very quickly uh, in Thursday see that how much of the pharmacy storage near you is so that you don't have to run to five pharmacies. You can just go to directly to the one that has stock five seconds ago. And so that, I think, is a good uh, use of transparency information. And we're not hoarding this to our official system. We're, in fact, publishing it as open API so that people can develop, like in indigenous languages, uh, for uh, people with uh, visibility or hearing impairment or whatever. They can develop new interfaces, new front ends. There's at least two chatbots now being developed. Uh, and that can distribute the same information without concentrating everybody uh, to the same official website, which will then create some pressure uh, to our international um, you know, visitors visiting the uh, service providers. So this idea of co-creation with the civil society is based on the already very strong relationship between the Ministry of Health and Welfare, which takes care of all the target three, um, which is you know, one, two, three, four. Five. They have five teams out of top 20 in last year's presidential hackathon. And so they know a lot about cross-sector collaboration and co-creating with the civil society and what we call civic hackers and citizen scientists. And so just by publishing data and working with the civil uh, citizen scientists, we can ensure the auditability and accountability of mask distribution. And again, this takes the credibility of all the different sectors. It is not just something that the government can do on our own. So we're very grateful to the civic hackers that contributed their time all voluntarily, as uh, is the pharmacy workers all voluntarily, into this uh, national mask uh, distribution idea. So 42 people. Um, so um, CKHS, uh, which is probably not a name of a person, the CKHS uh, would like to know, uh, what's your thought when overcoming the PRC government's blocking and participating in the meeting in the UN in a quote-unquote special way? This, this is not very special. This is just robot, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I gave a, a talk um, in uh, UN Geneva uh, using telepresence robots, looking like this. Um, right. And so, um, and this is actually what I do all the time. I, I did this um, not just in the UN setting. I did this long ago, um, I think starting 2014. Uh, and because of this telepresence robot, uh, we held entire summits, like the virtual island summit, which is ministerial level meeting between all the, uh, like, um, the Caribbean il um, islands, all the different uh, small islands, the Taiwan islands, Pescador or Penghu, each sending a representative to talk about how the islands can mitigate climate change together. And if we fly to the same place, like all to uh, Penghu, which is a beautiful uh, Pescador Island, a beautiful bay, uh, we will cause a lot of CO2 emission and therefore contribute to climate change uh, just by running the climate change summit, which is kind of ironic. Uh, so we decided to run the entire summit using Zoom, using a virtual summit, but we have an MC. We have this entire schedule. Everybody still participate. They focus, like, we ensure there's a broadband connection and things like that. So the summit was a success, and we published things after that. And so this uh, idea of telepresence meetings now is a norm, and more of a norm, not only because of coronavirus, which doesn't transmit over computer networks, but also because of climate change and people becoming more aware of the CO2 emissions that we cause by traveling. And so this is my habit. It just so happens that in UN buildings, they don't check the passports for robots. Uh, like Sophia, I, I don't think they check the robots for Sophia either. Uh, and then I was able then to speak uh, as an avatar uh, on this uh, robot to UN meeting, official UN meetings. Actually, I did this a lot of times. It's just the IGF was live streamed, and so people discover, oh, you can do this, right? And it's just not just me, but like uh, three other officials all piggybacked on me. And so this has now become a very convenient way for us to participate, uh, both because of the viral outbreak, but even before the viral outbreak, to say that we're reducing CO2 emissions. And so I think this is uh, a really good example of showing how the 
uh, traditional kind of Westphalian uh, idea of sovereignty uh, kind of loses meaning because you, if you post a message on social media to me, that's already three jurisdictions, that's already three cultures. If we don't have a way to form a multi-stakeholder way to come to our shared values despite different positions, and instead relying on national representatives, then the national representative has no way to listen at scale. It's only if we can represent our ideas with digital technology can we truly listen at scale and come to this truly international issue uh, and solutions. And I, I believe that many of your science fair projects are working on this as well. How will the international participants um, oh, okay, another motion, okay. So um, it seems that uh, while the sound has been fixed, I'm speaking too fast, uh, and people are asking me to speak slower. I will nevertheless say that the live stream will be kept as a recording so that you can replay, and I believe YouTube can replay at one quarter of the speed or something like that. Uh, and so um, if there is some part of it that, that you kind of miss because I spoke too fast, um, I, I will spoke, speak slower, but you can also watch the replay. Okay. So <laughs> 39 people would like to know. Um, how will the international participant communicate effectively with the Taiwanese judges? Very good question. First, for the international presidential hackathon, as well as the International Social Innovation Partnership Award, uh, the, the jury panel is international. So if you go to the uh, ph.taiwan website, presidential hackathon website, um, you will see uh, not only the beautiful, beautiful icons of the 17 uh, inter um, United Nations Sustainable Goals, but you will also see an uh, international track, in which case you will see that we're actually partnering with an international organization called the Open Contracting Partnership. So the easiest way is just to find your local chapter, your local collaborator and partner organization of the Open Contracting Partnership and discuss your ideas with them because they are, in a sense, also our uh, partners, they're like semi-consulates uh, for the purpose of this uh, international participation. And also, uh, you will be invited to Taiwan if you, um, like you already did actually, if you won the first round <laughs> of, of your idea selection, and then uh, you will mingle uh, with uh, domestic people working on similar sustainable goals because there's only 17 goals anyway. So chances are that the goals you're working on is probably also something in our top 20 is working on. So you can pair up and then you can deliver your solutions together in this uh, week uh, of the four days hackathon. And then the juries, which is international team, not just uh, domestic, uh, will make the judgment together. And so we're trying to make this as fair as possible for international participants. Uh, the previous uh, winners of the international track last year, which is uh, kind of for demo purpose, it's not at that time uh, ratified, uh, this year is ratified, uh, is uh, Honduras working on a system that before any national large development, they can work with local ecological uh, societies to do environmental impact assessment using citizen science data, not just government data, before they even procure to the large construction uh, vendors so that you don't have to protest, you can co-set the ecological agenda. And this is a really good innovation. And the other winner is from Malaysia. Uh, they call it the cartelogy, like the, the uh, study of detecting cartels. Uh, and that is to say um, the company that always bid together and only the same one wins, uh, called Weibiao uh, in Mandarin. Uh, and they develop an AI system to predict uh, cartels. Uh, and so I'm sure that there's many other issues uh, requiring uh, open contracting data, which we provide for free for academic purposes, to not only the end uh, bidding data or delivery data, but even the procurement RFP and everything like that for your analysis. So if you're interested in using that to further your studies, please check out the Presidential Hackathon website and click International Track. Um, I have, what, three more minutes? Um, so maybe the last one. So can technology help solve social problems? If so, how? Um, so first of all, um, do no harm. Technology can cause social harms very easily. Um, the social harm of 
teachers in a classroom no longer being able to retain the attention of their students is a social harm caused by social media. Uh, and that really is true, right? So when you're doing technology, think about the impact of your technologies, and that's always the first thing. If you're developing machine learning, of course, privacy and accountability applies. I'm sure you already know that. But most importantly, develop with people, not develop for people. Any technology that develops with people is technology that is blessed by your community. And you have endless people who can participate to make your ideas more applicable. And any technology that do not run into this problem is one that has communicated effectively by listening at scale. And this is a real example. There was a technology called Uber uh, that paired drivers with people who need a ride. And using AI technology back in 2015, we listened to lots of people just ideating, sharing their feelings on the common data collected by the civil society and the private sector and the public sector. And we asked for almost a month, what do you feel about this data? And this is something that's often missing, especially for hard science and applied science. We don't take the time to ask the citizens, how do you feel about this technology? We instead just start brainstorming about the best solution. That's called solutionism. So before developing solutions, ask people, how do you feel about this idea? And this feeling uh, gathering is now entirely automated. This is called POLIS. And the POLIS system, uh, which is entirely open source, and you're free to um, try it out, uh, it's called POLIS. Uh, I still publish on social archive on the use of POLIS, so I'm still a you know, part of the academic community. Uh, the use of POLIS uh, enables people to share whether they agree or disagree with a fellow sentiment, a fellow uh, citizen's feelings. And once you click agree or disagree, your avatar will move toward the people using uh, k-means clustering on a two-dimensional principal co co component analysis map to where the people who feel similar to you. But you can see your friends and family on the other side. It doesn't mean that they're kind of nameless trolls or enemies. It's just they feel differently, right? It's fine to feel differently. And the great innovation in this is that there is no reply button. So without the reply button, there's no room for trolls to grow. Slido has no reply button either. So you don't see trolling, right? You only see some wraps. But other than those wraps, there really is no way for trolls to grow in a system without a reply button. And so every time we run this public conversation, you always see this picture. And this is the last slide that I will display. This is the most, most important slide. If you only look at social media or indeed some institutional media, you will think that the society is divided, that there are exactly this many ideological div division grounds that separate people into two tribes that sees mutually each other as non-people. However, every time we run polis, like this one was in Kentucky, US, everybody now see transparently that actually most people feel the same with their neighbors most of the time. Everybody in Bowling Green, Kentucky, thinks that science, technology, engineering, math is not enough. The arts need to be part of the STEM education. It need to become STEM. Everybody agrees on that. That is the top cross-group consensus. It's just if you only look at social media and some institutional media, you never discover that. And so by listening at scale, the mayor then can just freely get, you know, 0.5% of re-election rate increase by adopting, ratifying this crowdsource idea of adding art to the STEM education. Because whether you identify as a Republican or a Democrat, Everybody is for this idea, and nobody is against it. So the more use of this listening skill to get feelings from how your technology applies to the society, the more likely that the society will support you in your research and your application. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, uh, 我们接下来请范市长、馆长以及校长等贵宾一起上台跟唐凤政务委员合影。
，让我们再一次热烈掌声，谢谢委员为我们带来精彩的演说，也非常感谢各位来宾、老师以及同学的参与。